Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. Lord be with you. We welcome you to the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington. We're glad you're here to worship with us. We are delighted by your presence, and we pray that this worship service will be a blessing to your heart and to your soul as we gather in the name of the Lord and offer our praises and thanksgivings to Almighty God. Uh, just uh, several announcements this morning from me and then uh, one or two from Sarah. Uh, there's a session meeting Tuesday at four o'clock in the fellowship hall. And after the session meeting, there will be a worship team meeting, but not at four or five o'clock as it says in the, in the bulletin, but at seven o'clock. So session meeting four o'clock and worship ministry team at seven o'clock. Uh, next Sunday is World Communion Sunday, and we will be gathering for Holy Communion with the entire Church of Jesus Christ throughout the world. But also next Sunday, I'm going to uh, make a change in our sermons. We've been in the book of Acts for quite a few months, but uh, starting next Sunday, I'm going to be preaching from the book of Job. How many of you have read the book of Job lately? Oh, <laughs> good. Well, I'm going to start a four-part series from the book of Job called Wisdom's Word on Suffering, because one of the crucial human questions that we all deal with is why is there so much suffering in the world? And the book of Job is an attempt to wrestle with and answer that question. So I invite you to read the book of Job along with me, and we will begin next Sunday with the sermon title being Why Suffering? Also, one more thing, we are beginning the search for a new office administrator, and uh, our faithful and wonderful office administrator, Mary Zakowski, is not here today, so she won't get to hear me brag about her. She has been absolutely wonderful, thoroughly organized, and always on top of everything, and I've been so grateful to be able to work with her. But her husband, Dr. Carl, is retiring from his chiropractic practice, and so she, of course, is going to retire with him. And so we're beginning the search for a new person to serve in our church office. And uh, if you have someone that you know who seems capable and qualified for a position like this, please send that person my way. And we will be glad to consider their qualifications, their resume, and hopefully God will bring us the right person in the next two or three weeks so that that person can begin to get oriented before Mary leaves at the end of October. But we're grateful to Mary for her faithful service, and uh, she will be hard to replace, but we wish her and Carl well in retirement. So keep that in mind, and thank you. Uh, Sarah? I'm completely ignoring Stan's last announcement. I'm in denial that it's ever happening. We have exciting news. We have a new baby boy born to Patsy's daughter, Nicole. Nicole and Tyler welcomed a boy. For all those girls, Joshua Isaac Stahl was born, and I didn't, what day? Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning. And so our prayers of thanksgiving and praise are with them as they welcome this new, wonderful, wonderful, exciting baby into their family. Um, that's, and a boy. I, I think it's just lovely, and he will have a lot of people to help take care of him his whole life. How exciting. Friends, our food drive out, out in the narthex looks amazing, and there's so much there. Sugar Tree is coming on Wednesday to pick up the donations. So if you have any last-minute donations that you want to bring in, bring them in um, by Wednesday morning to be uh, collected. It looks amazing, and I think that there's so much good to be done by sharing our blessings. Friends, let's stand now as we come to worship the Lord. Stand with me, please. The world belongs to God, the earth and all its peoples. How good it is, how wonderful to live together in unity. Love and faith come together. Justice and peace join hands. Open our lips, O oh God, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Friends, turn to hymn number 142 
as we will sing together, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Hymn number 142. God is ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. With confidence in God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we confess that we have turned away from your will for our lives. For hurts we have hidden, for promises we have not kept, for poor stewardship of your abundant gifts, for kindly words we have refused to share, forgive us. For we are bearers of your image for this world. Grant that by your grace we would amend our ways and step into your fullness as bearers of goodness, fullness, joy, and peace. Through Christ we pray, amen. Please pray silently. Friends, God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might be made righteous in him. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Peace of the Lord be with you. Please greet each other safely. <laughs> Okay, so I was thinking this week about the way we get in arguments with each other, and sometimes those arguments lead to fights. And I started remembering John Rhodes. John Rhodes and I were in sixth grade, and somehow or other, he and I got in an argument, standing outside waiting to go into our classroom, out in the, in the schoolyard. And I don't know what started it, and I don't remember how it came about, but suddenly he and I were wrestling on the ground. We had a little fight, and I don't remember what happened or who broke it up or what the cause was, but I've never forgotten it to this day. Now, fortunately, John Rhodes and I have seen each other at high school reunions since then, and we've been friendly to each other, and he's a great guy, and he was a dentist. He's now a retired dentist. So he, things turned out all right for him, and I guess they turned out all right for me, but sometimes things can happen, people can exchange words, and they, they can get into a fight. And so this little book is called Rabbit and Squirrel and a Tale of War and Peas. Have you ever heard of it? No. Is it new to you? All right, well, I'm gonna share it with you. Rabbit and Squirrel and a Tale of War and Peas. Not too long ago, there lived a rabbit named Rabbit. Rabbit was very proud of her garden. She tended her carrots and lettuce with tremendous effort and care. Across the way, there lived a squirrel named Squirrel. Just as Rabbit was proud of her garden, Squirrel was proud of his. He tended his sweet peas and tomatoes with great energy and zeal. Though rabbit and squirrel lived right across the way from each other, they kept to themselves and never offered each other vegetables or even bothered to say hello. Until one day when rabbit woke up to find that something awful had happened. Someone had pulled up her crunchiest carrots. Someone had removed her leafiest lettuce. Rabbit had a very good idea who that very bad someone might be, so she hopped over to Squirrel's house and thumped on his door. Hello, Squirrel said. You are a pest, shouted Rabbit. Stay away from my garden or else. The next day, Squirrel woke up to find that something had awful had happened. Someone had snapped off his sweetest sweet peas. Someone had plucked his juiciest ripe tomatoes. Yeah. I guess they didn't realize it wasn't their garden. Okay. Squirrel had a very, idea, I, very good idea who that very bad someone might be. He scurried over to Rabbit's house and scratched on her door. What is it, asked Rabbit. You are a pest, shouted Squirrel. Stay away from my gardener else. Then he threw rot, his rottenest tomato at Rabbit's house and scurried away. I don't think this is going to turn out very good, is it? 
The next day, Squirrel woke up to find all his beautiful tomatoes plucked away and all of his sweet, sweet peas snapped off. This means war, he shouted, shaking his fist in Rabbit's direction. Later, Rabbit was enjoying a nice big salad, so tasty, she thought. I should have tried tomatoes and peas sooner. Just then, she heard a horrible rushing sound. It was the sound of water. Look what Squirrel's doing. You've ruined my garden and my house, cried Rabbit, giving Squirrel a push. You are my sworn enemy. Well, you've ruined my garden and you deserved it, said Squirrel, giving Rabbit a push. You are my sworn enemy. Just as they were thinking of worse things to do to each other, they heard a terrible booming voice from above. What happened to my garden, said the gardener. Your garden, said Rabbit and Squirrel. Get out of here, you pests, the gardener shouted. And she waved her pitchfork and stomped the ground with her big green boots. Rabbit and Squirrel hopped and scurried away as fast as they could. Nasty Squirrel, said Rabbit. You've ruined everything. Oh, they went into the dark woods. I left out that part. Nasty squirrel, said rabbit, you've ruined everything. Mean old rabbit, said squirrel, you've ruined everything. And so it went. Rabbit and squirrel stayed in the woods and continued to blame each other. One of these days, they'll get tired of fighting. And then hopefully, they'll learn to grow something new. Well, that's of course what we hope for the whole human race, isn't it? That we'll get tired of fighting and grow something new. So let's say a prayer together, and please join me in the prayer. And you, you repeat what I say. Dear God, help us to learn to be at peace and grow a better world for all your children. Amen. Thanks. Now you may go to Sunday school. Our scripture reading is from Acts chapter 15, and it says verses 1 to 35 in the bulletin, but I'm going to stop at verse 21. Verses, Acts 15, verses 1 through 21. You're, of course, welcome to go on and read through the rest of the chapter, but for our purposes today, verses 1 to 21 will be sufficient. Hear the word of God from the book of Acts. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. And they, re they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. 
Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophet, prophets as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David which has fallen. From its ruins I will rebuild it, and I will set it up, so that all other peoples may seek the Lord." even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood, For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then the apostles and the elders, with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Bersabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers, with the following letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders to the believers of Gentile origin in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. This is the word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O Lord, silence the voices of confusion, fear, and doubt that we might hear your still, small voice speaking in the depths of our hearts, that we might not be just hearers of the word, but also doers. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I love a good church fight, especially when it's in someone else's church. Churches fight over all sorts of things. They fight over the property, which hymnal to buy, and whether to have contemporary worship, traditional worship, or a blend of both. Churches fight over biblical and theological issues like the nature of salvation, how to interpret the Bible, the ordination of women, and how to welcome and include God's gay and lesbian people. Bill Wilson, director of the Center for Healthy Churches, writes that we are seeing an exponential increase in internal congregational conflict and turmoil. American Christians, he says, are destroying our churches from inside out. It's been coming for years, he says, and the stress of the coronavirus pandemic the coarsening of public life, the dark side of social media, and the ongoing decline of most church metrics have created a perfect storm of conflict. And so he writes, I've lost count of the number of people who have told me over the years about the scarring and trauma their local church inflicted upon them as they endured some sort of unholy war. Lately, he says, these calls and conversations are escalating. So how sad it is when church fights break out and how sad it is when clergy and laity allow themselves to be unwitting victims of secular politics, ambitious personal agendas, emotional immaturity, and overt power plays. But I'm here to tell you today that church fights are not always bad. It really depends on what you are fighting for. Some fights are worth having, but others are not. As an example of the latter, I read of one church that got into a conflict over pew kit cushions. 
That's right, pew cushions. New pew cushions were ordered for the pews in the sanctuary. And one lady was so irate over the color that was chosen that on the day when the pew cushions were dedicated, she brought her lawn chair. As an example of the former, a prominent Baptist church in the capital city of a nearby state, a church I was once a member of, by the way, had a fight over whether to embrace a multicultural future. About 15 years ago, a group of refugees from Burma, now called Myanmar, showed up at this church and wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to rent the building for their own congregation, but they also wanted to be a part of that very traditional Baptist congregation. These were people from the Karen ethnic group who are predominantly Baptist because they are the spiritual descendants of Baptist missionary Adoniram Judson. Well, so the congregation had to decide, do we welcome these folks and place a, make a place for them in our church and in our lives? Or do we continue to try to be the prestigious, all-white, affluent, old first church of years past? Well, the leaders knew how God was guiding them to embrace the future as a diverse and ethnically colorful congregation. But a significant number of members did not want that future, and so they left. That church is smaller now, but it has a vital God-inspired ministry to an increasingly diverse and multicultural community. Sometimes a good church fight, properly addressed, can lead to new insight and new understanding. A disagreement, honestly and respectfully addressed, can lead to greater clarity, a stronger bond, and a more faithful and fruitful witness. It's always good when people can agree to disagree and still be friends. A helpful guideline often attributed to John Wesley goes like this, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity. The church fight that happened in Acts chapter 15 was in fact over something essential. It had to do with the nature of salvation. Paul and Barnabas were basking in the success of their mission to the Gentiles, which we heard about last week in Acts 13 and 14. They traveled through what is now Asia Minor, Southern and Central Asia Minor, founding churches, having some success, experiencing some persecution, experiencing a misunderstanding in the town of Lystra that we talked about last week. But they had great success and many new believers came to the Lord. And so at the end of chapter 14, we read that they returned to Antioch in Syria, the church that had originally sent them forth, and they called together the whole congregation to report on how God had opened a door of faith for the Gentiles. But then we come to chapter 15 and a dark cloud appears on the horizon. Some unnamed Judeans had come to Antioch and it's interesting that Luke doesn't give them a name. He simply calls them certain individuals. In other words, this group doesn't represent the whole they weren't operating under the auspices of the apostles in Jerusalem, and they were not speaking for the church as a whole, but they were speaking just for themselves. One of the worst forms of ecclesiastical abuse is when a group of individuals feigns to speak for the whole church. This group did not hesitate to share their views. They said, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now later, Luke, Luke tells us that this particular group was of the Pharisee party. This group had heard rumors about what was going on in Antioch, that large numbers of Gentiles were being baptized and welcomed into the fellowship without first being circumcised. Circumcision, as you know, perhaps was first given to Abraham 
as a sign of the covenant God made with him and his descendants, and it has been the practice for Jewish males down to this day. It's a practice the rest of the world did not, the ancient world did not look with favor upon. Male circumcision was about as repugnant to first century Greeks and Romans as female circumcision is to most of the civilized world today. But the concern of those who argued for circumcision was not God's covenant with Abraham, but the question of salvation, soteriology, to use the theological term. They said it was for necessary for Gentiles coming into the church to first be circumcised and commanded to keep the law of Moses. In other words, they must first become Jewish, then they can be welcomed into the Christian church. It's interesting how in verse 1, circumcision is referred to as a custom. But in verse 5, it's referred to as law. There's a big difference between law and custom. A custom is a norm, a tradition, a practice that is helpful, meaningful, but not necessarily essential. A law is a rule. It's an edict, a non-negotiable. Sometimes the church disagrees over what is custom and sometimes over what is law. If what this group is saying is true, then the grace of God in Christ is not enough for salvation. You have to add to it the law of Moses. Peter, on the other hand, sums up the theology of the early church in verse 11 when he says, we believe that we are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, period. It's not that the Pharisee party didn't believe in grace. Paul himself had been a Pharisee, and no doubt he was not the only Pharisee who had come to faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah. But these Judeans were so bound up to their own customs that they were confusing non-essentials with essentials. They were making life more difficult, not only for the Gentile Christians, but also for the Holy Spirit. So let's pay close attention to what happens for there is a good model for conflict resolution to be found in this story. The Antioch church doesn't go rogue. They don't wash their hands of the Jerusalem church and say, ah, we don't need them. They show respect for the apostolic community. They understand that they would never have heard the gospel had it not been for the Jerusalem Christians. And so they don't say, oh, forget Jerusalem, let's just go do our own thing. Instead, they send a delegation up to Jerusalem. They send key leaders along with Paul and Barnabas. And notice that the response when that delegation arrives in Jerusalem, they are warmly welcomed by the apostles and the elders. There's a, a mutual respect between them. The mother church doesn't say, oh, brother, here comes trouble. They welcome Antioch with open arms as fellow believers in Christ. And then they call the council to order. Apparently, in this community, everyone's, everyone matters and everybody has a voice. And the whole church now gathers to take time to listen. The Spirit turns the tide of the meeting when Simon Peter takes the floor to remind everyone what happened years earlier at the house of a Roman army officer named Cornelius. Remember, back in Acts chapter 10, we covered that, that story some weeks ago. And how God said, how God, in, that, in the moment when Peter was preaching at the, at the house of Cornelius, and Cornelius had gathered all of his family and friends to hear Peter, he reminds everyone how God gave them the Holy Spirit exactly as he did to us. God treated the outsiders exactly as he treated us. And then Peter gets to the heart of the matter in verses 10 and 11, and I'm quoting from Eugene Peterson's The Message. So why are you now trying to out-God God? 
loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors and crushed us too. Don't we believe that we are saved because the master Jesus, amazingly and out of sheer generosity, moved to save us just as he did those from beyond our nation? So what are we arguing about? That's really the, 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 the important question, isn't, isn't it? In the middle of any conflict, what are we arguing about? Sometimes what seems to be the argument isn't really the argument. The issue on the surface isn't really the issue. Something deeper is going on. It's difficult, isn't it, to let God be God? How it can be hard to trust grace and to trust the spark of the divine within each one of us. One of the key things we see here is a high level of trust. Trust in each other, trust in the leaders, and above all, trust in God's guidance. And that meant a willingness to listen. And so they listened to Barnabas and Paul. They listened to Peter. And as we'll see in a moment, they will listen to James. And when trust breaks down, when Christians view each other with suspicion, when church members impugn each other's motives, when they engage in political maneuvering or take to Twitter to attack each other, well, that's when resolving conflicts becomes all the more difficult, if not downright impossible. And so as Bill Wilson writes, the next time you are tempted to turn on a Christian brother or sister and employ the tactics of secular politics or social media trolls, remember that Jesus has a higher calling for the church that bears his name. Seeking out that higher calling is what is happening here as Peter speaks, as Paul and Barnabas speak, and, and as they tell about the signs and the wonders that they experienced, that God did through them in their journeys, in their journey through uh, Asia Minor. And then every, everyone got quiet. And in the silence, they were able to hear God speak. And it was through James, James, that God spoke. Now, some of you are probably wondering, which James is this? Because there are several people named James in the New Testament. Which one is this? Well, this is not James the Apostle, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. That James was actually executed by Herod in chapter 12, in Acts chapter 12. Nor is this James, son of Alphaeus, another of the original 12 apostles, sometimes called James the Less or James the Just. No, this is James, the brother of Jesus. Jesus' brother, James. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 7, he wasn't even a believer until after the resurrection when the risen Lord appeared to him. But now he is head of the church, it would appear. And so after listening to the other voices, listening to the testimony of Peter, the testimony of Paul and Barnabas, James now speaks with a divinely given authority. He begins by placing all that they have heard in the context of scripture. Now remember that for them, their scripture was not our New Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. Paul probably hadn't even begun writing his first, first letters and the gospels wouldn't come along for another couple of decades. But when they, when they spoke of scripture, they're of course speaking of the Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament. And so James cites a passage from Amos 9 that sums up so much of the theology of both Acts and Paul. When the house of David is reestablished, then the Gentiles will come flocking in to share the blessings that will follow. James draws the inescapable conclusion that the Gentiles will be welcomed just as they are. No need to first submit to the Jewish rite of circumcision. This has been God's plan all along. And notice when James, finish, James finishes speaking, there is no vote taken. Now, if they'd been Baptists, they would have all voted. And maybe they wouldn't have all voted alike. I don't know. I've been in quite a few Baptist church business meetings, and I remember a couple of times when the things I wanted the church to do got voted down. Well, I learned a lot back then. I know more now than I did then, and I'm actually glad to be in a Presbyterian church where 
things can happen more in a more decent and orderly process. That's what we Presbyterians are known for, what, aren't, aren't we? Doing things decently and in order. Anyway, if they'd been Baptists, they would have voted, but spiritual leadership doesn't decide God's will through opinion polls or secret ballots. Spiritual leadership discerns God's direction through scripture, through tradition, through reason, and experience, and then moves on to consensus. And that's what we see happening here. After this holy general assembly has come to consensus, James speaks for the whole church when he says, we will not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God. Grace is sufficient. Later in verse 28, James will write up the decision in a letter to be sent with Paul and Barnabas to the believers in Antioch. And the letter will say, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to impose this burden on you. And so notice the order of priority. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Trust first in the guidance of the Spirit, then trust in your leaders. There was, as we can see, a high level of trust in James. Tradition says he had a nickname, Old Camel Knees, because he spent so much time on his knees in prayer. James, the brother of the Lord, was known as Old Camel Knees. And I think we can trust a leader like that. Speaking for the church, James wrote to Antioch saying, God's grace is sufficient, but then he adds some caveats. Please abstain from eating meat sacrificed to idols, from unkosher foods and from fornication and immorality. In other words, please respect the scruples of the tradition. Don't abuse your freedom by intentionally offending others, lest you look more like a pagan than a disciple. So they send the letter with representatives from Jerusalem to encourage them, and there was unity and there was joy both in Antioch and in Jerusalem. So one of the important lessons of this story is not to be afraid of conflict. Conflict is inevitable, inevitable in any human institution. Conflict occurs in marriage, in families, in the workplace, in the classroom, in all levels of government, and in the local church. Conflict is a normal part of life. When conflict happens in churches, it can be an opportunity to learn something new about God and about ourselves. It may signify that people are out of touch with each other or with the group, or that there is an injustice or structural problem within the community that needs to be changed. The best way to respond to conflict is first of all, not to be afraid of it, and second, to come together, listen to each other, Look for the people in our midst who are, who are wise and who are in tune with the Holy Spirit, and then prayerfully seek consensus on the best way forward. Conflict can be a means of God's revelation, of new direction for ministry and mission. A disagreement handled well can actually help to inoculate the church against bigger problems in the future. If a church really is acting like the family of God that we are supposed to be, we will have all the ups and downs that every family will. We will work together, laugh together, cry together, and occasionally disagree, but we will always be family. So we can always disagree without being disagreeable. Not just in this life, but as the church, we will be family for eternity, so we might as well learn how to get along here and now. So sisters and brothers, let this congregation, the Presbyterian Church of Wilmington, learn how to fight in ways that are positive, that help bring healing, that maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, and that advance the ministry and mission of the Church of Jesus Christ. Learning how to listen to each other, honoring the presence of the spirit in each other, being willing to, willing to compromise with each other and together seeking the mind of Christ, these are the keys to never wasting a good church fight. 
inherent in every conflict is the opportunity to embody more fully what it means to be the body of Christ in the world. So let us resolve to go forward together in love, trusting each other and the presence of God's Spirit within us and among us so that we can live out the true meaning of the new commandment that Jesus gave to his followers. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. So may it be. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Well, Lord, help us as your church in this place to be able to live together, laugh together, share together, love together, and when conflicts arise, listen to each other and seek the mind of Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please rise as you are able and let us affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us say what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank, thank you, Jeremy and Jen. That was beautiful. Today, keep in your prayers uh, Lori Gillette. Uh, Jim had to take her to the emergency room the other night, and there was a, a, a lot of tests were run, and then she was transported to University Hospital in Cincinnati, but he was able to bring her home later that same night. So she's home and, and is stable, but continue to keep uh, Lori and Jim in your prayers. Let us unite our hearts now in, as we pray together. God of mercy, God of love, you have called us to live in communion with all of your created world. Yet too often we have treated your world as our own private garbage dump. We have poisoned water, air, and soil without regard to the needs of future generations. We thoughtlessly wasted the precious resources you bequeathed to us and we've not appreciated the rich diversity both of creation and of the people who populate this world. So forgive our laziness and selfishness, our thoughtless waste of the gifts both of people and of nature. Help us to work for the conservation of this planet's abundant beauty and the natural resources that are so crucial to life of fullness and contentment. Help us to hear your voice that calls us to unity of purpose and action, to care for the vulnerable in our midst, to welcome the stranger and to look out for our neighbors. In a world that seems to, have be, to be never more divided and more threatened than it is now, help us to listen for your guidance in praying for the healing of your world. Today we pray for the people of Germany as they go to the polls to choose a new chancellor to succeed Angela Merkel. We thank you for her steady leadership over 16 years through many crises. We pray for the people of La Palma in the Canary Islands whose lives have been uprooted and homes and communities destroyed by the eruption of the Cumbre Vieja volcano. We pray for your children in Afghanistan, especially women and girls where the Taliban have refused to include women in its cabinet. We pray for all who are oppressed and targeted because of their gender. Lord, we pray for your children gathered at the Texas border seeking asylum in our nation, including many Haitians because of the longstanding turmoil and poverty of their nation. We pray that we will repent of all the ways that we have failed to see your divine image in them and in one another. And we also pray that all who are fleeing violence and trauma may find communities of welcome that will offer strength, support, and safety. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for those whose lives are closely linked to our own. Especially we lift Lori and Jim to you right now and pray for healing strength. And we pray for all those whose needs we entrust to you, along with our own needs in this moment of silence. Grant, O Lord, that our ministries as a congregation may be anchored in your love of justice and peace, and may all who serve grow in grace and in love for you as we commend ourselves to your care and guidance, uniting hearts and voices to pray as Jesus taught, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 485, To God Be the Glory. and love of our Lord Jesus Christ and know that you are loved and welcomed just as you are and go forth in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to be the church in the world to serve God always. Go now in peace. Thanks be to God and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.